We're continuing in our sermon series this week, The Ball and Chain. Talking about things that affect your life, that essentially weigh you down and keep you from walking in the victory Jesus purchased for you on the cross. Now, I don't want to see a show of hands, but I want you to recognize my heart behind this question. How many of you have ever been mad at Jesus? You might look at it and you might go, oh, I can't admit to being mad at Jesus. But I think if you're honest with yourself, there have been crises that have come up. There have been things that you have experienced. There has been pain and woundedness that you have gone through and you have looked at that. And while you may not have shaken your fist at Christ and been like, why are you doing this to me? You diverted the way you did life. You changed the way you interacted. You displayed in some ways your anger at Christ by going, you know, I'm just not talking to you. And I'm going to, to, to do what I have to do in order to be better. So we're talking today about being mad at Jesus with this thought in mind. The whole point of this series focuses us on two major words. I will be mastered by nothing. And not everything is constructive. The picture here basically is not to define sin for you. My job is not to say to you today, this is sin, this is not sin. My job is to get you to look at your habits, your hang-ups, the choices that you are making to determine if they have mastered or you have given them undue authority or they have deconstructed your spiritual life. Again, I'm having the conversation yesterday with a gentleman who attends our church, and we talked about this reality. First Peter chapter 2 talks about how God is building us to be a spiritual house. But many times we go through these seasons that for every brick God puts on, we come by and go, okay, this one's coming off. Because we are not living with God as our master. We are not living with Jesus really dictating terms in our lives. We are trying to manipulate the situation. Trying to handle it. Take care of it. And in the meanwhile, something else is our master. Something else is deconstructing our lives. Again, last week I presented this to you as a thought. There are two different ideas of holiness in the scripture. There is what's called positional holiness. And positional holiness is given to you through your acceptance of Jesus Christ. Because he is holy, you are holy. But there is also a second kind of branch of holiness that we can call behavioral holiness. It is the idea that because I am in Christ, I think, I act, and I react differently. It's what the writer of Hebrews points us to in Hebrews chapter 12, 14, and 15. He says, pursue holiness. Pursue holiness. Now, please understand, if holiness was 100% positional, all of it is a direct result of Jesus Christ, we wouldn't have to pursue it because we'd already have it. But this is where the writer of Hebrews is saying to us, no, go after holiness. You don't have it all. Go after it to get more of it. So it's not necessarily in what Christ has done. It's in what are you doing with the salvation with the heritage, with the knowledge of God that you have been given. That Greek word pursue means go after it with everything inside of you. Don't look this way. Don't look this way. Keep your eyes on the prize until you obtain it. Because if you don't, you will not be able to walk in the victory that Jesus purchased for you by the cross. You have to continue to become more like Christ. Are you with me this morning? And so with this in mind, 
there are things that come along and they attack us. Last week we talked about broken or misplaced expectations. Times when you think to yourself, people should act this way and they act that way. And you're going, what's wrong with them? And inadvertently, what often happens as a direct result of broken or misplaced expectations is your expectations become master over you. And you're living your life out through the relationship of they didn't do what they said they were going to do. They betrayed, they disappoint me, they're off the island. And oftentimes when we get to that point, we not only take out our frustration on the people that we are frustrated or they broke our hearts or they broke their promises, we're also taking it out on God, saying, well, God, why didn't you do better? In that? Why, why are they able to act like this? Where is my justice, God? So as we transition to this idea today, I initially was going to talk about broken relationships with people, but I feel like God turned this to a different direction and wants me to talk to you about when you feel like you're mad at God. You're mad at Christ because of situations that have occurred. Our text this morning is Psalm 147, verse 3, and it says, He heals the brokenhearted, He binds up their wounds. Brokenhearted, we, you know, perhaps we would look at it and just simply, okay, you, you got your feelings hurt. But it's so much deeper than that, the intention of what God intends to do. They broke the word up as I studied it in Greek and first focused on the idea of broken. And literally, it's maimed, crippled, and wrecked. So the idea of your broken heart is that your heart is maimed, crippled and wrecked, not just injured. It's not like you're sitting there and you're saying, oh, I don't want to say anything. I'll be a baby. No, it's the idea that something has so dramatically affected you to make you angry or frustrated or bitter or apathetic. But he brings it to this thought of broken, maimed, crippled and wrecked. This is no small thing. But we go to the idea of hearted, it's the idea of the essence of who you are. We, so we talk about the soul, okay? Forgive me, we talk about the spirit. The soul is eternal, it goes to God, but the spirit is the essence of who we are. So this idea of my spirit, it's my thinking, it's my experiences, it's my outlook, it's my training, all of that is me. We're triune beings, we have a spirit, a soul, and a body. Okay, the body dies. The spirit lives beyond this moment. The soul goes to God. And so with this in mind, what basically David is proclaiming here in Psalm 147 verse 3 is he's saying you are maimed, crippled, wrecked down to your very spirit. It is affecting you maybe in ways you don't even realized. And think about this, folks, is if you have been wounded that deeply, it will affect the victory that you have been, that has been paid for by the cross. So we have to address it. We have to address it. And here's how we'll address it today. I'm going to go back to, let me scroll down here just for a second. I'm going to propose today that you look at how you address the brokenness of relationship between you and Christ as will you be a Martha or will you be a Mary? A Martha or a Mary. And we'll go to some highlights from John chapter 11. We know that the Bible talks about Lazarus being sick. And it says that... Um, his, his sister sent word to Jesus, saying to Jesus, Jesus, your buddy, your man, your boy, he's sick. Come in and heal him. It, they fully expected that he would. Because it wasn't just a superficial relationship that Mary and Martha and Lazarus had. These were like family for Jesus. But Jesus hears it. And he stays where he is for two more days. Boy, that had to be like a slap in the face. 
Because again, Mary and Martha, Lazarus, I know Jesus can heal. He'll come. He'll heal me. I believe. And he stayed where he was for two more days. And then when he finally decides to go, he says, Lazarus is dead, but it's for your sake that I was not there. What was Jesus saying? Bigger picture here than you guys are presently seeing. Now let's go to him. As he goes, he finds out that Lazarus has been in the tomb four days, which means the guy already got there late. Lazarus was already dead. Think about this. By the time he got to Jesus, the messenger got to Jesus, okay? But what we see interesting happening here is that Jesus still goes, and as he is going on the journey, Martha hears that he's coming, and Martha goes out to meet Jesus. And it's an important component of this. Because if Martha went out to meet Jesus, and there's a contrast there, what did Mary decide to do? She didn't go. So Martha goes to meet Jesus. Mary stayed at home. And when Martha goes to meet Jesus, she comes to meet Jesus on the road, and she says, first thing out of her mouth, where were you? Now, it's written very pretty, Lord, if you were here, my brother would not have died. But we can look at it out of the pain of her heart, out of the brokenness and the grief that she's walking through. Running through her head would have been the idea if you had just been here. And she speaks it. She pours out her pain. But she does something very interesting beyond that. She says, God will give you whatever you ask. Wow. Was she expecting at that point Jesus to heal Lazarus? I don't know. So Jesus takes us a little bit deeper. He says... I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And she, he says, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replies. And Jesus, and I didn't add this to the text, but Jesus basically says to her, you're going to see something different here than what you expect. She goes back, and she says, hey, Mary, Jesus is here. I don't think for a minute Mary didn't know that Jesus was there. I think Mary made the choice, you want to go talk to Jesus? Fine. But I'm a little ticked off at him. I'm a little angry at him. If he wants to talk to me, he could come and talk to me, but I'm not talking to Jesus. I mean, did anybody ever been there? Yeah. Mary gets up quickly, goes out. Note something, and I'm going to hit this in a minute. Jesus didn't move from where he was. Do you see that? He was still at the place where Martha had met him. So something along the way happened that Martha meets Jesus, Martha goes back to Mary, but Jesus stayed right where he was. He could have gone back with Martha, but he chose not to. We'll dig into that for a minute. Mary reaches the place. She sees him. She falls at his feet. What does she say? The exact same thing her sister said, except the latter half. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. No, I'm mad. I'm mad at you. But it's interesting what Jesus does. He doesn't say the same things to her that he said to Martha. He doesn't challenge her faith. He meets her right at her need. Do you remember what it said? Jesus wept. Jesus didn't come along and go, what are you, some kind of idiot? Did you not forget what you, what you witnessed me seeing? Did you not? How can you say something like this to me, you, 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 you unbelieving person? No, he cries. He meets them right where they're at. And then they all walk to the tomb together. And Jesus says, take away the stone. And I love Martha in this case because she's still trying to have control of the situation. 
And I don't know if that's you, you know, you face a crisis, you go to God, you pray, and you still want to be in charge. Anybody? Yeah? No. Lord, if you take away that stone, he's going to stink. And what does Jesus do? Take away the stone. Dead man comes out, just like in the, the cartoon, wrapped up real tight, can't move. Jesus says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let me hit a little compare and contrast for you this morning on this. Mary and Martha both sent a message to Jesus. They both said, Jesus, we need you to do something here. But when it didn't pan out the way that Martha and Mary thought that it would, when Jesus came, only Martha goes to meet him. Mary stays at home. When Martha talks to Jesus, she pours her guts out to him. I am so hurt at this situation. But she also poured out her faith to him. And she says, I know that God can do whatever you ask. And Mary, she's mad. She's mad. But what I also think is funny is when they get to the tomb, they're trying to open up the thing. They're going to heal Lazarus. Martha's still engaged in the process. And Mary, you don't hear a word from her, do you? She's silent. So I ask you to consider this morning, who do you think had the more healthy, more rewarding experience to their faith? Martha or Mary? I mean, when you think about it, both of these women were traumatized by Jesus, by their perception of Jesus' lack of action. We could talk about broken expectations. We could talk about their thinking, human thinking, that Jesus should have been there because he loved them. He should have dropped everything that he was doing and ran to them as fast as he could. Except they didn't see the bigger picture. There was a bigger picture at play, but bigger picture or not, both of these women felt like they were stabbed through the heart, thinking that the one who should have been there wasn't. And that's where each of them took a relationship wound. But what they did when they were wounded mattered. As I said, Martha reminds Jesus of her faith. And Mary withdraws in distrust. When Martha meets Jesus on the road, she is raw, she is broken, she comes to him, but she doesn't hide. She doesn't seclude herself. She doesn't run from Jesus. She goes to him, pours out her pain, claims her position in Christ. And when asked, do you still believe? She said, yes. Yes, I do. So Martha's Faith is increased through this process, but Mary's relationship is going to need rebuilt, reconstructed. Remember that word from the last two weeks? Reconstructed. Martha does not lay down and die. Martha does not become a victim. Martha struggles to believe. Martha even tries to control the situation, but she stays involved. Martha sees the fruit of her faith, which is Lazarus raising from the dead. And the opposite is Mary. Mary is hurt. Mary is frustrated. Mary is even victimized. Mary feels like she's given so much to get so little in return. She feels used. She feels empty. She stays in the crowd of mourners. If you saw that, she doesn't get up close to Jesus, which was her norm. Remember, she was the one who sat at Jesus' feet. She's not sitting at Jesus' feet now. She's staying with the people who are making her feel better. So she doesn't engage Jesus. She doesn't get into his presence Sage, you're going to need to fix this slide. What it comes down to is that um, Mary's faith in Christ needed reconstructed. It needed reconstructed. But remember something. 
when we talked about this series, we talked about two words, mastery and constructive. And remember I talked to you about constructive, that constructive means that either you are building new or you are rebuilding what has been destroyed. So when it talks about not all things are constructive, it's actually saying the habits, the hangups, the things that you are involved in either build up or they build onto and fix what has been taken off. And I just want to give you three thoughts as we wrap this up. Mary's relationship with Jesus needed constructive. And there's some life lessons that I think that we can apply as well. For example, the idea that you don't have an option. If you are in Christ, you cannot live apart from Christ. You either live in Christ or you live away from Christ. But if you live away from Christ, understand you will not walk in the victory that Jesus purchased for you by the cross. So when I say you don't have an option, being mad at Christ, mad at your situation, shaking your fist at God going, why is this happening? How is this fair? Is putting you in a very difficult place. You see, at one extreme, God understands our weaknesses and he is moving and trying to help us one day to see the bigger picture. But on the other extreme, we can, we can place ourselves so far away from his influence, so far away from the rest of the herd of believers that we become more susceptible to the walls that God is trying to build being taken down. And if we continue in that way, 1 John 1, 5 and 7 says it this way. If we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. So you can have that holiness that Jesus purchased for you by the cross but you will not see God because your behavior is opposite of his intentions for you. So this picture is this, not rebuilding, not letting God have the trowel and the mortar and the bricks. Rebuilding your life is surrendering to mastery from someone else and surrendering to the deconstruction that's occurring. But number two, you do have grace. You might not have an option, but you have grace. David wrote in Psalm 73, 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Again, I ask you to think about what Jesus does. He waits for Mary. He did not grow closer to her. He did not leave her. He stayed right where he was and said, essentially, hey, Mary, you know what Martha knows. You have all the facts and the information. You have all the truth that you need. Come to me. Come to me and we'll work it out. So Jesus knew she had everything that she needed in order to work through it. He did not allow for further distance. He didn't say, oh, you don't believe? Well, I'm gone. He stayed right where she was at. He didn't shame her when she came to him. He didn't comment to her lack of faith or lack of action. He put himself right where Martha had met him and then through Martha invited Mary to come and see him. And why is this significant? Because Mary had it in her to do what was right. She didn't need any further teaching. She didn't need anyone to come along and instruct her. She needed to put the pieces together and position herself back to behavioral holiness. It is a positioning of yourself to see God. Mary needed to position herself to receive her reconstruction, to receive her healing. So grace was given here. The grace that was given to her was grace to fail, grace to think, grace to formulate a new idea, and grace to come to Jesus. 
but yet it's my position. She still doesn't come with the right attitude. She shows up. Jesus meets her right where she needs him to, which is another act of grace. And then in the next moments, he is rebuilding. He is moving her from deconstruction to construction. Again, remember that word. It's such a powerful picture. That construction has as much to do, when Paul used that word constructive in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, it has as much to do with rebuilding, healing, as it does with new building. And folks, the beautiful part of grace is that it understands that repair takes time. God's not asking you, one of the biggest mistakes that we've made in the church is we've said, come to the altar, say a little prayer, and everything's going to be okay. There are times you have to say many prayers. There are times that healing is a process. There are times forgiveness is a process. And we're better to continue to come than to think we've done it once and now we're golden. Let me give you the last idea here. You have a standing invitation. Matthew chapter eleven twenty eight says, Come to me and I will give you rest. If you want to understand why we often don't walk in victory... Understand that part of the reason is we don't take advantage of God's standing invitation. We get angry. We get hurt. We stop doing the things that construct our growth in God. And we do nothing, which often is the very things that tear down what God has built and made. So every day, think of it this way. Every day, Jesus comes to the work site with block and mortar and equipment that he needs to build and to rebuild and simply waits for the invitation, go to work. But oftentimes we're distracted, we're mad, or we're making the choice not to walk in victory. We blame him then because we don't see victory. We don't see power. And it's because we approach him with the wrong posture. Do you want to know how to receive your healing? How to see God reconstruct the tears that you have taken down in your life by being angry? It's in a posture. It's this, not this. You see, when your posture is like this, you're saying, I trust you to put into my hands exactly what I need in order that I am sustained in order that I am healed, in order that I am no longer broken. I trust you. I am reaching out with you in supplication, saying, fill these hands with good things. If my hands are closed, now I get to pick. And when you don't show me something that I want in my hands, well, now I'm going to hit you. Do you follow where I'm going? And so it's a posture thing. I'm either going to accept in full trust that whatever has happened has happened in God's scheme to work all things out for good, or I'm going to fight him. And if I fight him, I cannot walk in the victory that Jesus purchased for me by the cross. So what will I do? Again, folks, here's the question. Is Jesus master of your life or not? And I want to ask it again. Is he master of your life or not? Is he constructing and rebuilding what life has torn down? Is he constructing new? Is he rebuilding what life has torn down? Does he have the invitation to go beyond your anger or your moment? Or is he sitting there, trowel in hand, fresh concrete, blocks on the ground, waiting for you to say, okay, I'm done fighting you. I'll now surrender to you. One great way of looking at this is asking, answering this question. Are there wounds I define myself from keeping Jesus from defining me? And so for application, and we're done. You have to choose today whether or not you're going to be a Martha or a Mary. 
You have to choose if you're going to go to Jesus, if you're going to meet him on the road, if you're going to tell him your pain, if you're going to proclaim hope, and if you're going to trust in what he says, and if you're going to stay engaged until something happens. Or you can choose to step back, hide with the mourners, express your anger, and not walk in the victory Jesus purchased for you by the cross. Let's pray. So God, as we conclude our time here today, God, we are asked, what will you do with this message? God, I would be incredibly naive to believe that there are not people in this room that carry in their hearts some real anger towards you, who play out each and every day with the struggle of I know I need to be the Christian I need to be, but I just don't trust you because you've hurt me. And we blame God for the very things that God can use to make us victorious. I pray, God, that what parts of this message are meant for each person to hear and to work through in their lives, God, it would stick with them. It would trouble them. It would challenge them. God, and if there needs to be today people who are saying, you know, I've been a Mary far too long. And today I need to be a Martha, especially in this situation. I've shook my fist at God. I've been angry at him. I've not allowed him to heal and rebuild or construct new in my life. I've defined myself through pain. I've let situations come between he and I. Today I want to be a Martha instead of a Mary. If this morning that's you, God wants you to be that Martha. And if you would simply in your heart acknowledge, I need this. I need to change my approach. I need to get one-on-one -on -one and let God reconstruct me. Just hear the words of the prayer and receive it for yourself. That God is in the business of healing the brokenhearted and binding up their wounds. And today he's speaking to you.